Uh, next month will be Dr. Matson talking about planning and executing clinical studies. Uh, this was actually, I went to ORS, the Orthopedic Research Society meeting this uh, year, and this was a full day session on clinical research. So it's becoming more and more of an issue, which is nice for someone like me, who only does clinical research. Um, in April, it looks like Dr. Leopold will be coming to talk about writing papers. And then <laughs> um, May 6th, we're going to have uh, Dr. White talk about mucopolysaccharide diseases. And then resident research <coughs> day practice on June 3rd. Uh, one other announcement I was told to remind you. So on the website, and I think in your boot camp material, you got that the resident research grant competition opens April 1st. That has been changed to April 15th. So you have a few, two weeks to work on that extra. Okay, so um, since today our talk is going to reflect prosthetics and orthotics, I went and searched our literature to see who in our department has done something, and obviously Dr. Smith um, was somebody I thought of. And what was nice for me is this is the um, first author, Dave Wow, is actually out of the Department of Pharmacy where my PhD program is and he's a well-known statistician, and he's since moved on to work for the Department of Defense. Um, but they did a nice uh, cost projection for service members with major limb loss from Vietnam and um, Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, so here's the title. So they had two research questions in this article. Uh, one was to estimate costs of different types of prosthetic devices based on Medicare costs and then to project the future prosthetic device costs uh, using these two cohorts, the Vietnam and the OIF OEF. And their design was a cross-sectional, it was kind of a combined design. They did cross-sectional survey design and then they also did Markov cost models. Who here is familiar with Markov cost models? Anybody? Okay, good. Just slightly about that for your statistical education. Uh, so they did a survey um, using mail, telephone, or website. And then it was with veterans from both conflicts with at least one major traumatic amputation, and that excluded if they had just a digit loss amputation. So here was kind of their method schematic. They did the survey first. They, that, that then informed their cost matrix, which they got from Medicare. Uh, then they kind of combined all that. Then they did their Markov models, and then they projected their results. They did a five-year, 10-year, 20-year, and lifetime, which included up to 100 years. Ooh, and this turned out pretty slow. Um, wait, there we go. Okay. So this is, uh, does any, uh, what if I said decision analysis, or, yeah. So that's, Aaron, I keep getting this. Uh, always disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, so typically cost models, especially Markov models, so Markovs are different than standard decision tree because what you can do is you can cycle in and out of these various states. So here, this is a lower limb model. Uh, it was, you, you can be in one of these categories, so you can have died after your, your lower limb injury. Um, sorry, this is so fuzzy. Uh, high impact activity, low impact activities, varying speed walkers. So each, this came from the uh, cross-sectional survey they did. They asked what they could do. And then th did they survive, you know, the, their, or did they die? So in each, each, transition, they could have died, or then they could have improved, or they could have gotten worse, or, and then what ended up happening is kind of where did they end up? So were they only able to do low impact activities? And each of these have probabilities that, what's your probability of transitioning from a varying speed walker to dying of your limb uh, amputation or surviving? And then if you survived, uh, did you decline, did you improve, or did you have no change? And if you improve, were you able to do low impact activities? So each of these cycles, there's a cost associated with them and a probability to transition into that. Um, and then what you can do is you can, once you've developed these, and a lot of people mostly do them in Excel, there's a program also called triage or triage that people will use uh, typically. Um, and you can fluctuate and change these probabilities and you can provide sensitivity analysis around that. So you can kind of get a min and a max of what your cost might be and these are also used to do quality of life adjustments. So if you do, um, dis uh, if you do um, <coughs> discrete choice and a discrete choice, or give me the other one, Kenny. There's two ways. 
two ways you can get, um, sorry, I'm blanking. We'll, we'll say pregnancy brain on that one. Um, discrete choice analysis allows you to ask patients, given a certain scenario, would they choose A or B? And with that, you get a number on a scale of zero to one, and that's their rank of how they would feel about being in that state. So you can combine that with costs, and you can get quality adjusted life years. Or you mean indirect? <coughs> Say that again? Direct versus indirect. Direct? Yes, that's the other So the subjects in the study, they had 298 Vietnam veterans and 285 um, Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom uh, veterans. They had, so the slash, the, 40, the first number is the Vietnam cohort, and the second number is the later conflict number. So 47 and 50 unilateral upper limb loss, 178 and 172 unilateral limb loss, lower limb loss, six and seven bilateral upper limb, and then 67 and 54 multiple limb loss. 78% used a prosthetic device in the Vietnam cohort, and then 90% used um, a prosthetic device in the second cohort. So here were their five-year cost results. So for unilateral upper limb, the average cost for a Vietnam vet was 31,129. And boy, a big jump for the Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom cohort, 117,000. Uh, for lower limb, that cost went to 82, and then uh, for the, the second cohort, 228, 229, and then multiple limb costs were almost half half a billion. Is that correct? Right? Yeah, no, half a million. Sorry, half a million for the um, the second cohort, and 131,000 for the Vietnam. And then here are their sensitivity analysis. So it gives you a range of the, the upper and lower limits that these costs range. So these, are, you know, are these like direct costs? Like so I have a list. I mean, they took this, like this. each piece no, of the, is that what you meant? Yeah, I mean, of it the count the components or does it also yes. count the cost of clinic visits? No, this was just device socks. related cost. This was like, um, I, I should have put that list because that's a good question. They had it, you can go look at the article, but. Um, you know, for every little joint and sock, and so it was just device related. This was not care related at all. And here's a graphical description of the five, 10, and 20 in life, lifetime costs. And I mean, you can really see, here's the scale zero to 0.6 in millions, and then for the uh, later conflict, it's zero to three million. So huge jump for those guys. Oops, sorry, wrong slide. And my other slide got cut. Okay, um, so the interesting thing is this, I don't know where my other slide went. Anyway, the interesting thing is they can, the, the whole reason they did this study was it was um, done, asked by the Veterans Affairs so, um, Administration to do this so they could project out what they might be spending for these veterans in the future. Um, and so that, that was why they did this for administrative reasons for the Veterans Affairs to basically set out their budgets for the next 5, 10, and 20 in lifetime years um, of these veterans in these conflicts. So anyway, little brief introduction. I want to get Dr. Morgan Roth up here. So today we're going to have Dr. Morgan Roth. He's from um, the Department of Physical Medi Medicine and Rehab. Is that, is that it? It's What's called it? Re Rehab Medicine here. Rehab but medicine. Okay. Many names. Uh, he did his residency in PMR at UW um, and received a K-12 funded research fellowship and this was the title of his uh, K-12. So um, it's nice to have an expert come and talk to us about that. We, we've struggled to get someone to discuss prosthetics and orthotics, so I know the residents are looking to this talk. So thank you. Thanks. And I'll just switch out here. You've got a pointer, it looks like. Yeah. Okay. Turn on the mic. Oh, it's just for oh, Okay. Yeah, great. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me speak with you this morning. Um, Dr. Cavanaugh asked me a couple months ago to give this talk, and I understand it was actually at, at the request of the residents that my understanding is you guys get uh, pretty good exposure to amputation from a surgical perspective. 
but the sort of what happens after that, the, the rehabilitation and prosthetic prescription, you don't have as much exposure to. Is that sort of an accurate descriptor? Yes. Okay. Great. So my goal is to, in 30 or 40 minutes, give you an overview of that entire process of the sort of the amputee rehab and prosthetics and how that relates. Let's see. Let's see. Do you know why it's not coming up here? Um, your jack might be bad because if this is the second adapter you've tried. Well, <clears throat> while he's working on that, uh, let me just tell you, you guys, my standpoint, where I'm coming from. So I did my residency here at UW, as Amy mentioned, and uh, I've been working primarily at the VA since then, and I do a mixture of clinical work and research, and uh, my focus is amputee rehab. So my, uh, my research relates to the same clinical work I do a lot in prosthetics and actually secondary disabilities and amputees. So I'm going to focus this talk on the clinical side, which I think will be more helpful and interesting to you guys, but I'm going to pepper it with a little bit of the research implications of some of these things. I, I don't know how many of you are involved in research. Do you guys have a research requirement in your department? And is that something like a case report or you actually have to do a research project? <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's that? They're supposed to do more than a case report. Okay. <laughs> so some of you have opted for the case report route and some haven't, that, I guess. That, that rule came in after we got grandfathered into the case report okay. <laughs> you, were, you were the lucky one, huh? It's no longer okay. Okay. Well, for the unlucky cohort who can't just do a case report, we'll, we'll talk a little research as we go. But it, again, it will be primarily, thanks, <laughs> it will be primarily clinical. Okay. Um, so, and one of the things to know about, you guys all rotate through the VA, I assume? Yes. Okay. Uh, one of the things you may not be aware of is we have a, uh, an amputation system of care through the VA, so it's different than at Harborview where you have excellent amputee care, but uh, we actually have a national system through the VA and we're one of seven regional amputee centers nationally through, through the VA. So it is sort of a, a clinical center of excellence for amputee care, but uh, we also have a research center of excellence for amputee rehab, prosthetics, things like that. And Bruce Sanjorsen is the, the director of that research center. So just a brief outline. We're going to talk about, we're going to start off with amputee rehab, then jump into prosthetic prescription, and then we'll talk a little about amputee gait and alignment. How much training do you guys get on gait analysis in general? Z I see a zero. Okay. Is that something that's ever on your boards? Anything related to gait? Okay. Um, so I'll try and give you, give you just a little bit of that. It's, you know, it's, it's a little challenging in such a short time frame. I run a course for the, the rehab residents, and this is a three-month course covering what I'm going to try and cover in 30 minutes for you guys today. So it'll be a bit of a whirlwind. I'll try and leave a little bit of time for questions at the end. So if there is something that you want me to really focus on, you can ask about that. To put this all into context, you may or may not be aware of the, the numbers here. So in 2005, there was a study done which showed 1.6 million amputees in the US. One million of which are lower limb. And I'm really going to focus this talk on lower limb amputees, which is most of what you guys are going to end up seeing. Uh, 600,000 of which are major, essentially meaning transtibular, transfemoral, or more proximal. So toe, ray, wouldn't count as a major. This is projected to rise more than double. So why do you think that is? Diabetes. Diabetes vascular disease, et cetera, yeah, primarily. Um, one thing, you know, to keep in mind for a boards type question that theoretically could be asked, the difference between prevalence and incidence with uh, dysvascular diabetic type of amputees versus traumatic, which do you think has a higher prevalence and which do you think has a higher incidence? Any thoughts? Well, who lives longer? Traumatic amputees or dysvascular amputees? Traumatic. Right. So the traumatics live longer, so there are more of them alive at any given time, but there's many more incident dysvascular amputations that are done. And just for comparison, I threw up the uh, spinal cord injury prevalence, 250,000. So there's, it's, clearly there's a big burden of disease here in terms of the problem. This is something, I w this is more of a, a sort of a philosophical, thought-provoking slide. 
for for a, uh, I would say a majority of people, both wi within and outside of the, the medical realm, amputation is often seen as a failure of the medical system. So we can't save the limb, so we cut it off, and that's sort of the last thing we can do. And unfortunately, in a lot of centers where they don't have good training in amputation surgeries, this n not being one of those centers, you guys get great training, it, there's you know, almost a guillotine type of amputation done, which is terrible for the patient because you can't do much with that from a prosthetic standpoint. Clearly that's not what's done here and it shouldn't be what's done anywhere. But I want you guys, and you probably already think of it this way, to think in terms of that you can think of amputation as more of a functionally restoring type of surgical procedure rather than something that is sort of a last resort failure. And we have a lot of folks who come to us after a year, two years of chronic wounds, they're in and out of the hospital, finally they get a transtibial amputation and they get their life back because we fit them with a prosthesis a few months later and they're up doing things that they used to do prior to all those chronic wounds. So just as an example. Does anyone know, by the way, the, the guy all the way on the far right who that is? How many of you guys know who that is? Pistorius. Yeah, Sasker Pistorius. So clearly that's the far extreme of functionality, someone who is competing in the able-bodied Olympics. Okay. So the amputee rehab team, <clears throat> well, our physiatrist is me and you guys are the surgeons, so we clearly work closely together. But there's a lot of other members of this team. And at the center of the team is the patient. So we're all focused on the patient and it's an interactive team with, with the patient's goals in mind. So in general, you can sort of think about the stages of recovery as preoperative stages. And it's interesting to think of preoperative as a stage of recovery, but in terms of amputee rehab, we like to think of it this way. Postoperative and then the intermediate to stable stage. Some people will call this the prosthetic fitting f phase or stage. The problem with that is not all of our amputees go on to wear a prosthesis. And we'll talk a little more in detail. So I'm just going to touch on each of these. <clears throat> and by the way, if you guys have any questions as I go, feel free to raise a hand, stop me. So the, uh, the, the rehab consult team, and you know, there's a consult team here at Harborview, there's a consult team at the VA, prior to amputation can help with a whole number of different things. So thinking about pre-morbid functional status and post-amputation goals, why is this important? Well, I'll give an example. When I'm in, in amputee clinic as a rehab physician, sometimes I'll get a patient who comes from, let's say, an outside hospital, and the patient comes to me and says, okay, doc, I'm here to get my prosthesis. And this is a new transfemoral amputee who's 75 years old, has a list of comorbidities that goes down the page, you know, 20 or 25 comorbidities, can barely breathe because they're, even in speaking to me, they're, they're becoming dyspneic. They have, you know, a recent, uh, let's say, triple bypass surgery. Um, a whole host of other comorbidities, and they haven't walked in five or six years, and they've just had their amputation. But their surgeon told them, oh yeah, you know, after your surgery, you're going to go and get a prosthesis, and you're going to be doing fine. Well, that's a problem, because then I really look like a bad guy when I say, actually, you're going to be unsafe to have a prosthesis. You're not going to be able to use it, and it'll be more dangerous for you than beneficial. So the importance of understanding pre-morbidly is important to set patients' expectations before surgery. And you guys deal with this all the time with any type of surgery, right? I mean, you're thinking about what are outcomes going to be? How can you best educate your patients in terms of what their expected outcome will be? So it's an important topic area. The psychological risk factors, this is also important. So coping with an amputation is not easy for most patients, especially your young traumatic amputees who are quite functional. So really picking this up from the start and, uh, and working with them on the, the psychological uh, adaptation is, is important. Talking a little about assistive devices, equipment needs that someone's going to need. So after an amputation, when you guys are done with the amputation, after they've, they're no longer on the acute service, then the question is where do they go? Are they going to be able to go back home? Are they going to have to go to a skilled nursing facility? Are they going to go to the inpatient rehab unit? And having this discussion where we understand some of the environmental barriers that they're going to have in their home, let's say, to have a wheelchair get through the doorways is important so that we know even pre-surgically 
what we're going to have to think about post-surgically in terms of discharge. And again, identifying these sort of architectural, financial, and social barriers are important. Are you talking about an elective amputation? Uh, you don't want to call it one in the morning for a traumatic amputation to come talk to them before we You can call me, but the residents in rehab probably wouldn't like it. No, yeah, I'm talking about uh, an elective, elective amputation. Or not necessarily an elective amputation, but an, a non-urgent amputation. So often when, with your dysvascular patients, you know you're going to do an amputation, but maybe you're not going to do it you know, for four days or something like that. Okay, uh, so assessing nutritional needs, obviously that's important for wound healing. And starting a prehab program or a pre-rehab program. So this is important. Things like if, they, if a patient has some joint contractures because they are not especially mobile, trying to get you know, physical therapy involved to, to stretch out those joint contractures can make the difference between someone who's going to walk and someone who's not going to walk with a prosthesis. Another thing to think about, when you guys are considering uh, an amputation for a patient of yours, the, the general sort of idea is that the more, di the more distal the level, the more functional they're going to be. And I assume you guys learn this idea, whereas the more proximal the level, the better from a wound healing perspective, generally speaking. So whether or not this is trauma or, or dysvascular, if you, know, if you have uh, tissue that's not viable secondary to trauma or you have a, a dysvascular pa diabetic patient who obviously the more distal you go, the worse their blood supply is. Well, you have to balance those two things out and where do they meet? And uh, it's, there's no easy answer to this, but one thing that I want you guys to think about is this is not always the case that with a more distal level that you're more functional. So an example I'll give you is a Chopard amputation. So how many of you guys have, have taken part in a, a Chopard amputation? I see about two or three of you. Chopard amputation does have its place, but oftentimes this is a nightmare from a sort of an orthotic standpoint to create a situation where someone's going to be functional. And a lot of our Chopard amputees go on to more proximal levels of amputation. Another example is a SIMS. There is controversy over whether a SIMS or an ankle disarticulation amputation is an appropriate level or whether a transtibial, which is clearly you're going more proximally, is going to be a more functional level. Um, Obviously, if you're not cutting through the tibia, you have a potential weight-bearing surface that's nice. Do people actually use that? And how tricky is that to fit from a prosthetic standpoint? There is, you know, there's some problems with it. Same thing goes with a knee disarticulation. And, you know, you guys have probably all worked with Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith has gone back and forth in his career in thinking whether a knee disarticulation is a more appropriate level than a distal transfemoral amputation. How many of you guys have done a, a knee disarticulation with Dr. Smith? So a few of you. And I think at this point he's, he's back within the realm of favoring knee disarticulation. But it is challenging from a prosthetic standpoint to fit a knee disarticulation sometimes. So, yeah. We did a knee disarticulation, but then we did a closed femoral shortening. Okay. So the, Yeah. You're referring to adult, right? here. Yeah, everything I'm talking about here is primarily related to adults. Yeah. I don't see any, any pediatric patients. Do awesome with the science. Yes, absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, and of course there's the reamputation rates. The more distal you go, and this is really pr primarily talking about your, your diabetic and dysvascular population, the more distal you, you go, generally speaking, the more the chances are that you're going to have to reamputate at a more proximal level. So this doesn't mean you shouldn't do a more distal level, but it's something to keep in mind as you go. And obviously, if you have a patient who you think is, is, has about a year to live, you don't want them to spend that, the whole rest of that year in the hospital. So that may be the difference of doing a more distal versus a more proximal level of amputation. Okay, so um, you're going to see some of the same themes here, but uh, immediate post-op, obviously, bed mobility and transfers and ADLs is incredibly important for the patient to learn to, A, get back home primarily, which is most patients' goals after amputation. Uh, single limb ambulation or wheelchair mobility, and in, in many cases it's both. You want someone to be able to get around in their wheelchair, but also to be up in their walker. And sometimes the home has architectural barriers where you can't get a wheelchair through the doorway, so they're mostly in the wheelchair, but then they have to get up and hop in the walker to get into the bathroom or something like that. Preventing joint contractures, again, is so important. I have unfortunately seen these patients who would do well with a prosthesis, but they come from an outside facility where they never saw physical therapy, 
and they lay in bed after their amputation with their knee up on a pillow, let's say for a transtibial, developed a 30 degree knee flexion contracture and they weren't able to walk with a prosthesis because of that. And once you get a 30 degree knee flexion contracture, it's, it's pretty challenging to, uh, to work that out and to get them back down to, uh, to zero, let alone even 15 degree knee flexion contracture. Psychological adjustment continues to be important. This rehab plan, just sort of coordinating in general. I mean, as you go back to that first slide where I showed all the players on the team, coordinating all those players to optimize the care of that individual is, is important. Discussing prosthetic options. And when I say this, I, I include in this whether or not a prosthesis is actually going to be beneficial for the patient. So that's not a given. And ensuring a safe discharge with all the equipment needs and, of course, the long-term follow-up care. Okay, so um, pre-prosthetic phase, some of the same ideas. Obviously, we have to continue to promote wound healing and uh, prevent injury to the residual limb. Same ideas, though, sufficient mobility in ADLs to safely return home, maintain joint range of motion, strengthening and conditioning, psychological adjustment, and addressing pain, which is a big problem. So what percentage of amputees do you think have phantom limb pain? Lower extremity amputees, let's say. 60%. What does someone else think? 80%. Depends how you ask the question. The, the studies show somewhere between 20 and 90%. If you ask someone, big range. If you ask someone, have you ever had any phantom limb pain? 90% say yes. If you ask someone, do you have debilitating phantom limb pain regularly? 20% say yes, as sort of a general rule, or 20 to 30%. And residual limb pain is obviously a problem. Okay. So let's talk about prosthetic prescription. I have a question. Yeah. Sometimes we can't get somebody into inpatient rehab right away because uh, their wound isn't healed or whatever. Is it hard for the rehab team to get them back into inpatient rehab once the wound is okay and they're ready for whatever their gait training with their new limb? Uh, when you say hard, you mean if they've already gone home and, and getting them back from so home? Or patient and their wound isn't ready for a prosthesis, they're yeah. going to get a prosthesis. They don't all the time go into inpatient rehab. Sometimes they go home with the plan that they're going to come back. Right. Is that hard to get them back? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, it's hard for me to answer how it works at Harborview. At the VA, it's a little easier for me to answer. Yeah. It's not hard unless there's no beds on rehab. And right now, unfortunately, there's a nursing shortage, so they're, they're down the number of beds that they have, which is frustrating. But um, I don't know the answer at Harborview. So we just really just got to make sure that they have that rehab follow-up at six weeks or whatever, and then the, the rehab team will help get yes. that patient in the inpatient rehab at that time that the wound looks yeah. good enough to get Absolutely. You know, what this does bring up, though, is the issue of insurance. And at the VA, we don't have to follow the same Medicare rules that have to be followed here. So uh, if you have a sort of a, you know, a 65-year-old dysvascular diabetic amputee who doesn't have other s significant comorbidities, who has a non-complicated transtibial amp amputation, you often can't get that paid for on inpatient rehab. Whereas at the VA, we would then get that patient into inpatient rehab for gay training. So. I can't speak to all the details of that, you know, but that's where getting follow-up with the rehab team and here they'll know the details of that, of whether or not they'll actually qualify from a financial per or an insurance perspective to be able to get onto the, onto the rehab unit. Okay, any other questions so far? Great. Uh, prosthetic prescription. So we have all these fancy parts which cost a lot of money, as Amy talked to you about, and how do we decide what to use? Well, first of all, we have to decide, is your patient even ready for a prosthesis? Is their skin healed? Is their edema controlled? And this is relative control. When you fit someone with a prosthesis they're, for the first time, they're usually going to have some edema. But when someone has a, an incredibly bulbous limb with that really tight pitting edema, that's not going to be an easy fit from a prosthetic standpoint. So we really want to set them up with stump shrinkers initially before we cast them for the first time with a prosthesis. Cognitive status. Do they have the cognitive ability to learn how to put on a prosthesis, take it off, practice the proper hygiene so they don't end up with a, a raging fungal infection within the prosthesis? Functional mobility. Can they transfer? And can they hop in the parallel bars? So there's a lot of research that goes into how do you predict whether someone is going to be a successful prosthetic user or a successful ambulator with a prosthesis. And the results are a bit mixed. Uh, one theme that goes throughout that literature is the idea that if someone can pull to stand independently, that's a fairly good predictor that they'll at least be able to use a prosthesis for transfers. So 
the difference between a transtibial user and a transfemoral user is huge. For a transtibial amputee who is close to being able to transfer on their own, let's say from wheelchair to bed or from the wheelchair to stand up in the parallel bars, the prosthesis may be the thing that gets them over the hump and enables them to at least transfer successfully, maybe do some limited ambulation. For a transfemoral user, a prosthesis does not make transferring any easier. And uh, essentially, if you have someone who can't transfer on their own, that's not someone who's going to be a prosthetic user unless they can learn to transfer on their own. So that's a fairly good uh, benchmark. Are they independent in pushing their wheelchair? Sitting and standing balance. So you stand someone up in the parallel bars and you have them raise their hands just slightly off the bars, obviously on one leg. Do they immediately fall over? What's their sense of balance? That's going to really be a, a large predictor of how successful they'll be with a prosthesis. And again, especially at the transfemoral level where it becomes much more challenging to use. Strength, range of motion, coordination, all of these are obviously important factors as well. And what are the patient's goals? So this comes into play especially with patients who have loftier goals, let's say. So, you know, I see a lot of the, the OEF, OIF guys who come back and their goals are things like they want to go kite surfing and they want to be ice climbing. They want to, you know, be doing everything. And often things that they had never done when they were an intact individual. They see it as a challenge. I'm an amputee now. I want to be able to not just get back to where I was. I want to go beyond that. Some of them will say, I want to go back and be a soldier. So then obviously you have your dysvascular guys who say, you know what, all I want is to be able to walk up the stairs to my home and be able to get on my lazy boy and watch TV and that's fine, that's enough. So it's important to really understand what your patient's goals are. And sometimes their goals are such that having a prosthesis is not something that's important for achieving their goals. That's unusual, but it does happen. And then there's other, other factors, vision, status of the other limb. Motivation is a huge one. Okay, so as I mentioned, not everyone is going to get a prosthesis. Just like anything, there's this sort of potential risk and potential benefit profile that you have to consider with everything we do in medicine. There's major safety concerns. Falls are a big problem. You have your, your dysvascular patient who's had a, an atrial valve replacement is on Coumadin with an INR of 2.5. They take a fall. That may lead to them dying eventually. So just an example, but uh, transfemoral amputees, again, especially, are very prone to falls. About 50% of all transfemoral amputees, if you ask them, and this is all comers, including young traumatic patients, will say, within the past month, I've had maybe one fall. Uh, <clears throat> current functional abilities is important, again, to assess, and potential functional abilities with a prosthetic limb. So this is getting back to this idea of, is a transtibial prosthesis going to help them transfer better, whereas a transfemoral prosthesis will not. And of course, again, their goals. Okay, so we have all these different parts. I'm going to start off by focusing on transtibial level, then we'll get a little into prosthetic knees, and, uh, but we will touch on some of the transfemoral level stuff too. Socket design, suspension mechanism, so how that's actually held on, the interface, which is what goes between the socket and the residual limb, the pylon and foot. Socket design, I'm just going to touch on. There are a few different socket designs. I, I don't have time to go into these in detail, but I just listed a couple in the transtibial and a couple in the transfemoral. I give you this one diagram here to, to sort of show this idea of a bony lock over the ischium. So most of the transfemoral sockets we make these days have that bony lock, so that's called an ischial containment type socket. This quadrilateral, this is the, old, the, the Vietnam guys, this is the style that they have and they want, continue to want. And that's what's called an ischial seat, where the ischium just actually sits on a brim of the socket. So it doesn't have this nice capture. Okay, suspension mechanisms. I list them here, I have pictures of them on the next slide, so look at this list and it's probably easier to look at the pictures. So we'll start off with the pin lock because this is the most common one that we use. The residual limb is up here. So this is a gel liner right here that goes over the residual limb that you actually roll on. The pin comes down with an attachment in this sort of umbrella that's seated within the gel liner. And this is the socket. So the socket's going to go up here. That socket has a shuttle lock, which this pin then engages into. And this is a release button. So once that pin goes into the shuttle lock, 
you can't really pull the thing off. And there's uh, this gel liner has, um, it's the type of material that once it's on your skin, it's not going to slide off. There are problems sometimes with amputees who sweat a lot where it decreases the coefficient of friction and it can start to slide a little bit. But it's a really nice positive suspension mechanism. And when you want to let it go, you just push the button and then the limb will slide right off. It'll release that shuttle valve. A similar system is shown here. So again, this is the socket right here. This is the residual limb in the gel liner. And this is a lanyard. So this is a lanyard that comes out through a hole in the socket. And then it, there's a little buckle right here. So you pull it through the hole. So as, as you push your, your uh, residual limb with the gel liner in, you sort of pull that lanyard through that hole. And then you strap it over that, that buckle and strap it back down to itself. It's just Velcro. And that also holds you in. One reason you might want to use this system over this system is in a new transtibial amputee who has that sort of bulbous shape after healing and they still have some distal edema. What you're doing here is you're enabling the ability to pull down on that distal tissue to sort of straighten it down and pull it into the socket. Whereas with the pin, you're trying to jam it down in there, which doesn't work so well with those big bulbous limbs. Okay, um, knee sleeve suspension. So this is the socket down here. So the foot would be down here. And this is the thigh. And the knee sleeve is essentially a neoprene sleeve that you roll up from the socket up over the thigh. Oftentimes, these will have a little expulsion valve on the bottom. So you get a, a suction effect that really holds someone in. Uh, you have to have good hand strength. to This is a really sort of taut neoprene sleeve. So to be able to roll it up over your, your thigh. If you have one of these big thigh girths that comes down at this type of angle, it's not going to work. It's just going to roll right down. So there's a lot of factors that come into play when you're thinking about which suspension mechanism. This is a more of an old school type of mechanism, super patellar cuff strap. Yeah? I have a quick question. On, so regarding BMI and prosthetics, yeah. is there a cutoff? Or no. Is, there, is it more a shape? There is a weight cutoff, not a BMI cutoff. And, and that relates to the, tensile, or to the compressive and tensile strength of the materials themselves. It depends on the component. Generally speaking, for let's say for trans, most transtibial components, the weight cutoff for you know a lot of prosthetic feet tends to be somewhere about 325. That's minus the limb that you just took off. Right yeah, here. yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you know, what you're really dealing with is in in most cases a carbon fiber leaf spring type of foot, and if you load it with too much weight, clearly you're going to break it. Um, it's not just the foot itself. There's actual other, you know, the pylon strength and the pyramid adapters. But, you know, there are heavy duty materials you can use and sometimes get someone up to 400 pounds in a prosthesis. It becomes more challenging, clearly. But, um, so there's not an absolute weight cutoff. It just depends on the, the type of prosthetic component. Is there a general rule? I have a sense that there are some people that you can look at and be like, you know what, this person, because they're heavyweight, is not going to be able to use. Um, yeah, it, because we see these people. Like, sure. You say, you know, say whether or not you think they can use a prosthesis, and I hate telling people that they can use one when I'm looking back, and probably a lot of them could. Yeah. So. Um, well, what I'd say is it's one, of, it's one of the factors. I mean, if you have someone who's 700 pounds, I think it's yeah. fairly safe to say they're not going to use a prosthesis. If you have someone who's 350 pounds, it's one of the factors to consider. If they're otherwise extremely functional and they don't have many comorbidities, they, they might. And it depends, again, if they're transtibial or transfemoral. If they're transtibial, it's more likely. But again, there, there are a whole host of factors that are involved, as I sort of showed earlier. So. Um, I'd say, you know, talk it over with your rehab colleagues. And um, it's, you know, there's not always a perfect answer. What we're trying to do is, is make a prediction. And we're using a lot of factors to make that prediction. And there's some evidence in the literature to guide us. But it's not perfect at this point. OK, and uh, so just lastly, this, this super patellar cuff strap. This is literally just either a buckle or a Velcro strap that you can pull over, the, you know, essentially over the patella and strap it down. It's very easy to use. So if you have your diabetic patient with a severe peripheral neuropathy, intrinsic minus hands, who can't roll on a knee sleeve, can't roll on a gel liner, this is a system that may work. It's not as good in terms of the suspension is not quite as positive. So you get a little pistoning. But for someone who's just getting up out of the chair and maybe walking to the bathroom, it, it does fine usually. There are a few other type of mechanisms, but these are probably the most common ones.
and the interface. I mentioned the gel liner already. And uh, so this is someone rolling on a gel liner right here. Gel liner, again, can be used with multiple different suspension mechanisms. Wool socks. Wool socks can be used over a gel liner or just directly on the skin. A P-Lite liner, I'm giving an example right here. So this is a closed cell foam type of material that you essentially shape to the limb. And you can put little handles on it so that can actually ease, ease the donning of the prosthesis for some people. And you can have no interface. So some of our transfemoral amputees have a dry suction fit. So they literally just, they maybe put a, a little bit of lotion on their skin and, or sometimes they don't and they use what's called an umbrella where, or a parachute, which is this cloth that they put over their limb and then pull it through a suction valve and pull their, their limb down into their prosthesis or the prosthetic socket and then replace the one-way suction valve and they have a tight suction fit. It's a very intimate feeling fit. It's a very positive suspension. Doesn't work for everybody. You have to have a very stable residual limb volume. This is not what you're going to use in your first time transfemoral amputee. But for some of our, our long-term users, it works quite well. The pylon, just briefly, you have this endoskeletal versus exoskeletal. That's an exoskeletal pylon. For your guy who lives, you know, uh, in the Spokane area and loves to go hunting and fishing and is kind of roaming through all this bramble that's, you know, always sort of tearing at the prosthesis, they tend to like these exoskeletal uh, pylons. And they're, they're tough. The problem is they're not adjustable. <coughs> you can't change the alignment. Endoskeletal is more what you see. This is an endoskeletal pylon right here. You can see this guy has, we have a lot of, a lot of patients who really like to sort of have designs put on their prosthetic limb. Um, that's the more typical system. It's adjustable. It's lightweight. So that's the default system unless someone has a specific reason for an exoskeletal. You can have a rotator built in and or a shock absorber. This is a specific prosthesis. So you can see that little blue bubble right there. That acts as both a a torsion adapter, a rotator, and a shock absorber. So that's a foot that is called the, the reflex rotate foot. And so someone who likes to play golf, for instance, that's a really nice foot where you need a little bit of a rotation down at the ankle. Okay, prosthetic feet. There are hundreds of prosthetic feet on the market, hundreds of them. These are a few, this is one way you can categorize them. There are other ways you can categorize them too. There's not a perfect system of categorization. But in general, the most common you'll see are these energy storing and release feet, which are called by industry dynamic elastic response, which doesn't really mean anything. So I like to call them energy storing and release. And those are your typical leaf spring type feet. I'll show pictures on the next slide. Single axis foot. Um, <coughs> these are older feet that literally just have an axis in the sagittal plane. So they have some motion, but they don't have any ML motion. Then you have your multi-axial feet, which for someone, let's say, who has goals of hiking, you need some ML motion. And so those folks are going to want a multi-axial style foot. If you give someone with poor balance a multi-axial foot, they're going to fall over. So you have to keep, keep both things in mind. The really old school is the satch foot, the solid ankle cushion heel. These now come free with prosthetic limbs. So that's how cheap they are. So here's a satch foot. This compressible foam material. You have this solid ankle block made of wood, essentially. Um, very inexpensive to make. Doesn't work that well, but it, you know, um, it's what used to be used. This is your more typical type of leaf spring, energy storing and release foot. So it's literally just a piece of carbon fiber that you have a compressible heel here and a compressible toe. <coughs> so as you step down, that heel compresses and then it stores some spring energy essentially, which as you roll onto the toe and then go towards terminal, terminal stance phase of gait, you are able to supposedly, and the studies have shown mixed results as to whether this is true, use some of that energy storage to spring off and to push off. I give an example here. This is, uh, this is a college park foot that uses a, this is essentially a mountain bike shock. So this is for someone who'd be more active and would be putting a lot of, of uh, weight into their heel during, you know, whatever type of activity. And you can adjust the, uh, the damping characteristics of the shock. This is an example of a multi-axial foot. So you have the, the two blades over here. And you can't see it so well, but these are elastomeric bumpers, which essentially they don't really store energy, but they have nice damping qualities to them. And then there's the future of prosthetic limbs. Has anyone heard of, of Hugh Her? 
This is a, he, he's a scientist at MIT who lost both of his limbs uh, in a frostbite injury. He was a, a very serious mountain climber, and a uh, rock climber, and he was caught in a blizzard when he was 17 for three days, sort of in a snow cave, that kind of thing. And he is now sort of on the forefront of prosthetic technology in his lab at MIT. So this was the cover of Wired magazine. This is Amy Mullins, who's a, also a famous bilateral transtibial amputee, who's a sprinter and a model. But what he's wearing here are the uh, earlier generation of a powered prosthetic ankle. So um, while all of these are passive devices that you see here, even if it has a little bit of spring energy return, this is an active device. And the newer version of this, which is called the Biome Foot, is the only device on the market which has powered push-off. So using actuators. So, um, so literally during terminal stance, if, if I'm talking about my right leg, if you guys can all see me here, as I'm going into terminal stance, it will actually power me into push-off just like your gastroc soleus would do in an intact ankle. <clears throat> and what she's wearing are, these are running specific prosthetic limbs. Same leaf, spr leaf spring design, but with much more energy return. These are what Oscar Pistorius wears when he's sprinting, and this is what generated all the controversy of whether he's more energetically efficient than an intact human. So whether other, other intact individuals should be cutting off their legs to gain an advantage. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay, um, this is where I'm going to touch really briefly on the research side. So. From the epidemiolo epidemiologic literature, we know that amputees get a lot of contralateral knee pain, lower extremity amputees. More than twice as likely as non-amputees to develop, again, this is their intact knee pain. And there's also studies that have shown increased uh, degenerative changes on imaging. So the thought being that a lot of this is related to knee osteoarthritis. Sort of makes sense if you think about it. When an amputee walks, they're going to load their intact limb more than their, their prosthetic limb, generally speaking. What's interesting is transtibial amputees are five times less likely as non-amputees to develop knee pain on their amputated side. So it's actually protective. Having an amputation is protective. So all your patients who might develop knee arthritis just cut their leg off and they won't <laughs> develop knee arthritis. <clears throat> so here's where the research comes in. I mentioned Hugh Herr's biome foot. This was uh, a few years back. We had a collaboration in our research center with Art Quo and, and Peter Adamchak at the University of Michigan, who also do a lot of pr prosthetic design engineering. They came up with this foot called the CSER, Controlled Energy Storage and Release. You have to have a good name with anything you design as an engineer. And essentially, this foot works with a coil spring and a latch mechanism. So it actually stores energy at heel strike. The latch holds the, the coil spring with that stored energy. And then with a little microprocessor, it times the release of that energy during push-off. So that's cool. That enables us to, and you'll see it in action here. So this is in a non-amputee in a stimulator boot. So you see that latch hold. You roll over through mid-stance towards terminal stance. And I want you to watch the spring energy release as you go through terminal stance, which you'll see right here. So. Cool. We have a foot that no longer acts as a passive device, but actually gives us some push off. And using uh, some, uh, there's something called the dynamic gait model of gait, which basically says that the less push off you have on your trailing limb, so as I'm walking, if I'm not really pushing off from my trailing limb, the harder you're going to hit essentially on your loading limb in basic terms. So I thought, well, if we have these, uh, probably increase knee loading as a cause of knee osteoarthritis on that intact limb. If we can increase push-off, maybe we can reduce the knee loading on the intact limb. So we compared this research foot, that Caesar foot that I mentioned here, with some of these passive feet. And the reason there's two here, this is our, our control situation, which is a Seattleite foot. It's a pretty stiff foot. And then we allowed the patient to wear their, whatever they were prescribed. And, uh, this is a busy slide. I want you to focus on two things. The push-off peak, so the Caesar foot has much more push-off during terminal stance than the other two feet. And then this is knee loading. The Caesar foot has by far the least amount of, of loading there compared to the foot with the least push-off, the prosthetic foot with the least push-off has the most loading. 
So that's just a quick research application. All right, I'm going to fly through the last couple of slides in the last minute or so here. Alignment, this is just bench alignment, so you can, this is a very high tech device, a plumb line, you can get it for 59 cents at Hardwix. <laughs> so you drop that down, and that was bench alignment. This is a medially displaced foot, which you can either do, remember I mentioned the adjustability of an endoskeletal pylon? Well, you can either slide uh, a, trans, a linear translation, or you can sort of angle between the socket and the prosthetic pylon. The net effect is now your plumb line is lateral and your heel is medial. So how does this affect gait? Well, you have the path of the center of mass is lateral to the foot. So because that, that foot is now medial, your center of mass is, is going outside of that gait pattern, which is not great for stability. So you have a loss of balance to the prosthetic side. And you also will see, you will see the prosthetic socket move this way. So th it's called a, a, essentially a lateral thrust of the proximal socket brim. That'll happen during mid stance of gait. And you'll have increased pressure on the medial side. And it, there's a force couple, so the exact opposite's gonna happen down here. So what do you see if you have a patient who's abnormally aligned like this? Well, you watch them walk, and as they're walking, if you imagine I have a, a prosthetic socket here, I'll sort of exaggerate this. Every time I'm stepping down during mid stance, you'll see it sort of, you'll see the, uh, the prosthetic socket sort of moving out to the side like that. If they take off their limb, you may see redness on the medial side or maybe a, a wound on the medial side. Okay, this is just what I mentioned. And I just wanted to show you a quick video just so you can see what this looks like. Okay, so I have the loss of balance. What's harder to see, and I want you to really focus on it, see if you can see that, that motion of the, the socket. So it thrusts out laterally during mid-stance. It's a little tough to see at first, but um, if I had more time, we'd go through it in more detail. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I was going to do a little bit on uh, prosthetic knees, but I don't want to keep you guys late. And if, in case you do have any questions, I want to give you a chance to ask them. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe my first question would be, you know, this is our, one of our teaching conferences, but we have regularly scheduled Monday conferences as well that are longer. Yeah. Would you be interested in kind of being part of our curriculum and coming back and having more time to talk to us about gait and prosthetics? Yeah. Um, if I have... Know, once every two years. Um, yeah, I mean, as, assuming I can fit it into my schedule, why don't you get my email after and we can email about it. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, I, and I doubt you guys would ever have time to come to this, but we do have, you know, in, in the course that I teach through rehab, we go through gate in much more detail, so I can at least make that available. And any of you are welcome to come to that course if, if you actually can fit it into Where your you schedule. The course starts, it's a spring quarter course, so it starts in, uh, in April, runs through June. It's Tuesday and Thursday mornings. Yeah, so I, I figure that you guys are, yeah. Well, um, maybe when we exchange emails, I can send you guys the course schedule, so in case you can come, you have it there. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you.